Who are we? Where did we come from? What are the qualities that make us exclusively human? The appearance of humans marks a fundamental turning point in the history of our planet and all life upon it. The crossing of a genuine threshold of complexity after which nothing on earth would ever be quite the same again. To understand the roots, the rise and the true nature of civilization, we need to understand the origins of the beings who created it, ourselves. And to acquire that understanding, to understand our origins in the deepest possible way, we need to cast our net as widely as we can, drawing on all available sources of knowledge. In short, we need to study the origin of humans from the perspective of big history. So let's begin our inquiry in earnest by considering what fields such as archaeology, anthropology, paleontology and linguistics can tell us about the origins of humanity. The modern scientific explanation of the evolution of humans must surely start with Charles Darwin, because clearly we are products of natural selection like all other animals. Our species fits well into the modern biological taxonomy, and our place in that taxonomy provides a sense of just how much life had to evolve before we came on the scene. Who are we? We are multi-celled organisms belonging to the super kingdom of Eukaryota. That is, we are organisms with eukaryotic cells, which have, among other things, a nucleus and DNA in the form of chromosomes. We are members of the kingdom of Animalia. We are animals, not fungi or plants. We are in the phylum of Chordata, so we are animals with backbones. Our class is Mammalia. We are mammals. Our order is primates, which includes lemurs and monkeys. Our family is Hominidae, which includes humans, chimpanzees and gorillas. We are members of the subfamily of Homininae, bipedal apes. Our tribe is Hominini, which contains humans and our close extinct relatives. Our genus is Homo, or man. And finally, our species is classified as Homo sapiens, or wise man. We know that our order of primates possesses important properties. We are mammals that live or once lived in trees with dexterous hands and feet, with stereoscopic vision and with a large brain to process visual information. Our closest living relatives in the order of primates are the great apes, the orangutan, the gorilla and chimpanzee. And hominines, the subfamily to which humans belong, are a particular type of bipedal great ape. The first hominines evolved about 7 million years ago and there have been at least 30 or more different species with new ones being discovered seemingly every year but only one of these hominine species is still around today, and that is in fact us. Evidence gathered from different fields, including paleoarchaeology, which is the study of fossil bones and stone tools, uh, of primatology, the study of modern primates, and genetics, the study of genes, has allowed specialists to construct a reasonably coherent account of the history of our hominine ancestors. For most of the period that specialists have been investigating hominines, the most important type of evidence has been bones and associated remains. Skulls and skull fragments tell us how large hominine brains were, and even if there are notches in the skull where critical brain developments might have been located. And many skull fragments still have teeth in them, teeth that can tell us a lot about what this animal ate and therefore how it lived. In September 2015, researchers working in a cave in South Africa discovered so many teeth, bones and skull fragments that they were able to declare the existence of a previously unknown hominid species, Homo nalendi. An earlier classic example of how paleontologists use bones to study hominines is Lucy, an almost complete skeleton of an Australopithecine. Discovered by Donald Johansson in Ethiopia in 1974, Lucy was immediately recognisable to Johansson as bipedal because of where her backbone entered her skull and how her leg bones joined the hip. Stone tools found with bones or in isolation were manufactured by all later hominines, such as Homo habilis, Homo erectus and the Neanderthals. And these offer all sorts of clues about how these hominines thought. 
Uh, is there evidence of planning and foresight in what they make or build, for example? Are there tools specifically designed for left or right-handed users? Is there even a sense of the aesthetic in their construction? Like hominine teeth, microscopic studies of edges of these tools can tell us what hominines ate and also something about how they lived. One set of richly informative tools are those found in the Old Divai Gorge in Tanzania, a steep-sided ravine in the Great Rift Valley. These Olduin tools date from 2.5 million years ago and were manufactured by members of the Homo habilis species. Another form of evidence comes from studies of modern primates, such as orangutans and gorillas, which has the potential to tell us something about the social behaviours and abilities of our closest primates. An increasingly important avenue of more recent research comes from genetics. When two species separate from each other, uh, neutral mutations, which are changes in the non-coding DNA of a gene, accumulate in each line. Because the rate of accumulation of these mutations is constant, the number of mutations can tell us how old the species is and when the two lines diverged from a common ancestor. DNA evidence shows us that 98.4% of our genetic material is identical to that of chimps, and researchers have been able to show that it would have taken around 7 million years, which is about 280,000 human generations, for such a difference to evolve. So, somewhere around 7 million years ago, humans and chimps had a common ancestor. Let's be very clear on this point. This does not mean that humans are descended from monkeys or apes, which remains a common misconception even today. Rather, it means that humans and apes are all descended from a common ancestor. These various forms of evidence tell an extraordinary story of increasing complexity. Over 7 million years of hominid evolution, our ancestors' spines got straighter, their pelvises got narrower, their brains bigger, their arms shorter, Pairs bonded to form social and sexual relationships, communication and cooperation increased, fires got built, and hand axes got shaped. Given that the role of the environment in shaping human history is one of the key themes that big history identifies, it's not surprising that all of these adaptations occurred in the context of significant global climate change. Often this change was so severe that many individuals would have died before they could make the necessary biological and social adaptations. Between 6.5 and 5 million years ago, the climate became significantly cooler and drier, causing the equatorial forests in Africa to shrink and in many cases turn into open woodlands. In this new environment, bipedalism, which is upright walking on two legs, would have become an advantage although climate change is just one theory explaining the emergence of bipedalism. Others include that it provided for greater efficiency of movement, uh, it made carrying food easier, it allows us to see over the tall savanna grasses, or that it was a way for males to demonstrate their sexual prowess. But we really don't know. Remains of the oldest hominin species we are so far aware of, the 4.4 million year old Artipithecus ramidus, were discovered in 1994 in Ethiopia, a species that could walk upright but also use all four limbs to climb trees. The famous Lucy belonged to a different species, Australopithecus afarensis, which survived for an extraordinarily long period between 3.5 and 1.8 million years ago. Lucy's brain was only slightly larger than those of chimpanzees, about 400 cubic centimetres, but she was clearly bipedal. Along with bipedalism, by the way, came the gradual loss of body hair to help us keep cool on the savannah. Our ancestors kept the hair on the top of their heads, where the sun beat down directly, but otherwise lost the hair on their bodies to help them to forage during the warm daytime. Modern humans are not completely hairless, of course. We have retained some body hair and also the goosebumps that used to help our hair stand on end for increased insulation or as a threatening gesture. After the significant cooling of 5 million years ago, the climate stabilised until another period of dramatic cooling began about 2.5 million years ago. This renewed climate change may have triggered the appearance of the genus Homo, hominines with larger brains, shorter arms and guts and teeth adapted for eating more meat and less vegetation. 
Early Homo species were still rather ape-like, but Homo habilis is found with the earliest stone tools. The discovery of these tools led paleontologists at the time to suggest they had discovered the first humans. But today, Homo habilis is regarded as being closer to apes than humans. Why is tool usage no longer regarded as a, a critical point of differentiation between human beings and apes? Well, can you think of other species that use tools? How about chimps that make spears or special tools for hunting ants? Or crows that craft twigs into tools? Or Asian elephants that modify sticks for fly swatting? Or sea otters that use stones to break open abalone shells? Well, you get the picture. By two million years ago, Australopithecines and various Homo species were coexisting in open landscapes in larger groups. Their brains were larger, they were using their tools to eat scavenged meat, and possibly using fire to frighten off predators. The vocalizations early hominids made were probably similar to those of apes, although anthropologist Stephen Mithen has proposed that communal singing around a fire may have helped these ape-like calls evolve into genuine language. Think of them using synchronized vocalizations to calm themselves as night fell. Around 1.8 million years ago, the new species Homo erectus appeared with decidedly more human-like abilities. They were almost as tall as us, the brains were about 70% the size of ours, and they were fully bipedal with shorter arms because they no longer needed to climb into trees. Erectus had also evolved three semicircular canals of the inner ear that provide balance for jumping, running, and dancing. And the pelvis had considerably narrowed and flattened, making full standing and running easier, but childbirth more difficult. This meant that babies had to be born earlier, prematurely really, to get them out before their heads grew too large. Of course, these helpless babies required longer care, and mothers needed male assistance to feed infants and protect the family from predators. And this in turn led to pair bonding between parents and the emergence of patterns of cooperation and mutual assistance. Indeed, what we see emerging here are the roots of the family as we know it, a core element of human society which clearly crossed an important threshold with the evolution of this essential social unit. Evidence indicates that Homo erectus also used fire for cooking, and this be, may be one of the most significant adaptations made by our hominid ancestors. The use of fire distinguishes us from all other animals, and the social scene that developed around fires may have contributed to enhanced language and tool-making abilities. Fire allowed us to stay warm, to venture into colder climates, to ward off predators, and to cook our food. Cooking enabled us to derive more calories from our food so that we could spend less of our time hunting and eating and more of it on other activities. Homo erectus or its close relation Homo augusta was also the first hominine to move out of the African continent perhaps as early as 1.7 million years ago. This is another example of one of the key themes of human history, the role of the environment and climate change in necessitating migration. Uh, in a series of migrations, probably motivated by population pressure in their African homeland, or because they were following migrating animals that, had, that they had become dependent upon, Erectus undertook extraordinary migrations that took them all the way to China by 1.6 million years ago. Erectus probably spoke a proto-language, perhaps closer to Tarzan talk, and those that migrated into colder envi environments evolved to be lighter skinned to help them synthesize enough vitamin D in environments with less sunshine. With this list of quite extraordinary adaptations in mind, does Homo erectus deserve to be regarded as the first human? To try and answer this question, we need to circle back to our opening questions. Where did we come from? What makes humans unique? What traits do we possess that are exclusively human? Evolution can certainly explain why we are so similar to other hominines, but can it also explain why we are so different? Why our species uniquely has constructed the great civilizations of world history? We have just seen that hominines became more and more like us over time, but none have the creativity of our species, and natural selection still seem to rule their behavior. 
In contrast, we have a significantly enhanced ability to adapt, not biologically through natural selection, but culturally and technologically, using our creativity to change the environment to suit ourselves. Think of the specialized clothing and shelters we have invented that allow members of our species to survive in the most extreme conditions on the planet, the Sahara Desert, deep under the ocean, even at the South Pole. This adaptation is clearly a product of learning, something that many other animal species can do, of course, although learning is not as important as natural selection for most species. And even those animals that learn something well generally cannot share in any sort of detail what they've learned with other members of their species. This knowledge is lost when they die and each individual has to start from scratch. There is a third way of adapting, however, which depends on symbolic language and humans alone seem to have this ability. The words we use when we speak or write, the very words I'm using to talk to you now are symbols that can convey an extraordinary amount of information about something very concrete or something completely abstract or hypothetical. This symbolic language ability allows us to learn with other humans and learn in detail with precision. Perhaps the most important outcome of symbolic language ability is that when whatever we learn as individuals can be shared and pooled and passed on from generation to generation. It is this sharing and pooling of knowledge that surely explains why our species has adapted more successfully than any other large animal on Earth. It has given us the ability to collaborate through collective learning, an ability which clearly marks the crossing of another threshold of complexity by our extraordinary species. The difference between us and other species that cannot do collective learning is like the difference between standalone computers, which can access only the information stored in their memory, and network computers, which can use the information stored in millions of other computers. Because we can communicate with each other so efficiently, information about ways of dealing with the environment or dealing with each other, or ideas about weapons, about gods and government accumulates. This collaboration is not only spread over many different communities and cultures, it is passed on from generation to generation. Collective learning has given humans a, a more rapid, flexible and enduring way of adapting to the environment. We don't need to wait for gene mutations to occur. We simply exchange ideas on how to survive and prosper in an astonishing range of environments. Now, we really don't know how humans uniquely acquired this ability, but the appearance of genuinely symbolic language proper seems to have happened quickly, perhaps within the last 50,000 years. Animal behaviorists studying the language ability of our closest living relatives, apes and chimpanzees, have identified about 30 different calls that chimpanzees make. And some chimps have been taught to use these calls to reach the language ability of a two-year-old human. Coco, a domesticated gorilla born in the San Francisco Zoo, was taught by psychologist Penny Patterson to use American Sign Language, uh, eventually mastering perhaps 1,000 signs. But Coco was not capable of collective learning because there is no way she could pass this mastery on to successive generations. Some other animal species are able to impart knowledge instinctively to their newborns, but collective learning allows humans to pass on infinitely more complex information from generation to generation, through spoken language at first, and later through writing, through works of art, and through our educational institutions. So unlike humans, the history of chimps and gorillas, like that of all other animals on the planet, is still governed by natural selection, not by collective learning, by genetic change rather than cultural change. What makes the difference then? Is it brain size? Large brains do appear to be crucial for the acquisition of symbolic language ability, but if a large brain means advanced linguistic and adaptive abilities, why haven't other species gone down a similar evolutionary track? Perhaps it's because having large brains also leads to some serious problems. They demand energy to operate, lots of energy compared to body weight. The human brain is only about 2% of our body weight, but it uses 20% of all the energy our bodies use. 
And big brains also mean that our babies are born prematurely, before their heads are too big for childbirth. And then it takes a long time for brains to develop the wiring necessary for children to function well. No wonder large brain species are rare. Yet the brains of our hominid ancestors slowly grew larger over millions of years until Neanderthals appeared some 200,000 years ago with brains slightly larger even than those of modern humans. Does this mean that Neanderthals were capable of collective learning? Certainly their stone tools were more sophisticated than those of other hominines. Uh, They migrated into Ice Age lands. They used improved hunting technologies. And some of their burials were arranged, even ritualized. But Neanderthals appear to have had limited language ability, so they could not cross the collective learning threshold. This meant that they adapted much less successfully than humans, who may have essentially pushed them to extinction some 40,000 years ago through competitive replacement. So it can't just be brain size that matters in the acquisition of language then. It must also be the way the brain is organized. Tiny evolutionary changes in the wiring of the brain have made all the difference, particularly the evolution of a node known as Broca's area that facilitates speech and the appearance of specialized genes that permit language. How these changes occurred remains unclear. The best we can explain it is that in some isolated group of archaic humans, slight changes in brain structure occurred through genetic mutation that gave some individuals enhanced linguistic skills. These skills enabled them to survive much better than others, so through natural selection, their genes rapidly spread to create an entirely new species, Homo sapiens. Our species had a common ancestor who lived about 200,000 years ago somewhere in Africa, and early humans remained in Africa for the first 100,000 years or so of our existence. This means that although some Homo erectus had ventured out of Africa as early as 1.7 million years ago, it was back in Africa where our own species, like that of all other hominids, originated. Archaeological evidence that collective learning had taken over from natural selection in our species comes from improved stone technologies and the use of pigments for for body painting and for cave art is also probably evidence of the appearance of symbolic language ability. Our African ancestors also invented new lifeways and technologies for sustenance, barbed points on our spears, for example, on our fishing tools, uh, gathering shell foods and so on. We also learn to exchange objects and information over long distances, the beginning of what would develop into another key theme in human history, the importance of trade and cultural exchange. At first, these changes were slow, but after about 100,000 years ago, the pace of change began to increase. The people who lived in the Blombos Cave in South Africa are a classic example of this. They were arguably the most advanced humans on the planet at that time. Between 100,000 and 70,000 years ago, they made sharp stone spear points using methods that did not appear in Eurasia until tens of thousands of years later. They also made objects from bone, the earliest use of this material known, and they scored bits of bone and ochre with marks that probably had symbolic meaning. Between 100 and 90,000 years ago, evidence of change and collective learning gets clearer. Humans began to migrate out of Africa into various regions of Asia, then to Australia, and eventually through Siberia and on to the Americas. These migrations provide stunning evidence of the ability of humans to adapt to new environments. And the archaeological record shows faster and faster cultural change and increasing complexity. Humans began to create art, both naturalistic and abstract, to make more specialized tools, to weave and not fiber, to decorate their clothing, to make jewelry, and build semi-permanent structures. And then another remarkable acceleration occurred. Everything seems to have sped up around 50,000 years ago when archaeological sites in Eurasia and Africa show evidence of rapid innovation. The range of tools diversifies. Delicate implements like needles and harpoons appear, and tools made according to standardized patterns and from new materials like ivory and bone. More and more manufactured objects appear, carved shells, bones, female figurines, cave paintings, all evidence that humans were thinking symbolically and thus surely also using symbolic language. 
Materials including useful types of stone were now being exchanged over long distances and humans were exploiting an ever-increasing range of animal and plant species. Our ancestors also started moving into more environmentally difficult or inaccessible regions like Australia and eventually even Siberia during the height of the last ice age. This second acceleration, the seemingly quite rapid innovation of new technologies, lifeways and ideas from about 50,000 years ago is described by some archaeologists as genuinely revolutionary, the so-called revolution of the Upper Paleolithic. Archaeologists like Richard Klein argue that Even if archaic humans that looked a lot like us had evolved roughly 200,000 years ago, the Upper Paleolithic provides the earliest evidence of humans who also behaved like us. But in a counter-argument, archaeologists Sally McBrearty and Alison Brooks push back against the revolutionary thesis, proposing instead that the appearance of distinctly human behaviours was a more gradual process that began at least 200,000 years ago. They argued that the first humans in Africa were in fact behaving very much like modern humans, but that it took a long time before evidence of their distinctiveness showed up in the archaeological record. Part of the problem is that much less actual archaeology has been done in Africa than in Europe, so evidence of human behaviour might have been missed or ignored. McBrearty and Brooks offer a detailed review of the archaeological evidence and conclude that almost all the changes found in the Upper Paleolithic can be found much earlier in the African record. Admittedly, this archaeological dispute leaves us still in doubt as to the precise answers to our initial questions. How were we created? What makes us unique? But we've certainly made significant progress, I think, in assembling a likely scenario. Our capacity to keep developing new forms of behaviour and new ways of relating to our environment is surely part of the answer. Human ecological, technological and artistic creativity explains why we alone have a history of long-term cultural change and increasing control over our environment. The source of this creativity appears to be the efficiency of human language and the fact that we can share ideas so well that they get locked within the collective memory and begin to accumulate. So that in each human community, the available knowledge increases from generation to generation with the result that humans can collaborate more effectively than any other animal species we know of. Our species evolved around 200,000 years ago somewhere in Africa. From 100,000 years ago, our ancestors not only looked like modern humans, but also left signs of behaving like us, of adapting through collective learning. This evidence is indisputable from about 50,000 years ago. For our species, this was a proud and momentous development, For others, I'm afraid, it wasn't necessarily good news. As humans migrated into more and more environments, they displaced other species of hominines, including the Neanderthals and other types of animals, driving them to extinction. This trend has continued at an ever-increasing pace to the point that humans now utterly dominate the planet and have made a measurable impact on its environment on a global scale. Dutch chemist Paul Crutzen first promoted the idea that Human impact on the planet is now so great that our current geological era should be renamed the Anthropocene, the era in which humans have come to dominate the biosphere. Paleontologists from another star system studying the history of Earth even a billion years from now will find evidence of some fundamental and extremely rapid changes in the entire biosphere. These changes intensified in the late 20th, early 21st centuries and they were caused by the behaviour of a single species with some extraordinary qualities. So the arrival of humans on the planet was a fundamental turning point in the history of all life on Earth. Nothing would ever be the same again, not just for humans, but for every other living thing on the globe.